welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Before we do get started, I want to let you know the program's brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. You can give a one-time donation at support.greatdetectives.net. And also, we are uh, very specifically uh, promoting our Patreon campaign. If we get up above $600 in monthly pledges, I will do a special summer series. And the exact nature of that podcast series will be decided by our Patreon supporters, who can pledge as little as $2 or more a month. We're already more than 75% towards the goal, and I'm recording this uh, eight days in uh, advance. So uh, you can still support us if you're listening to this on the 30th or 31st uh, towards that goal at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Now for Philip Marlowe, the original air date on today's program, August the 25th of 1951, and the title is Air for G-String. Most Saturdays at this time, we spend an exciting half hour of adventure and action with America's public hero number one, Hopalong Cassidy. Well, even two fisted cowboys take summer vacations when they can, and Hoppy is no exception. But Hopalong and Topper will be back with us riding the CBS air trails again four weeks from tonight, September 22nd. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. There's no other end. They never learn. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's transcribed story, Air for G-String. There's nothing really wrong with a hot summer. But if some sadist really wanted to bring out the worst in anybody, particularly me, after a steaming day, all he has to do is expose me to air conditioning. Take, for instance, the Broadview Hotel, which was on Olive Street in downtown L.A. It ground out alternating currents of cold air from what could laughingly be called the lobby. I'd revolved through the usual doors and stood squinting into the icy darkness. When my eyes leveled off again, I made my way to the elevators sinking into the deep pile carpeting up to my hot and cold ankles. By the time I reached room 972, I was in the first stages of a chill. Air conditioning is a marvelous invention. It guarantees the summer cold for life. Oh, you're Mr. Marlowe? That's right. That makes you Mr. Allman, huh? Oh, come in. Martin Allman. Come in. Sure. Yeah, you're nothing like I'd pictured you, Mr. Allman. Uh, sit down, please, Mr. Marlowe. Pictured me? I don't understand. Well, all my life I'd heard about Philadelphia lawyers. Somewhere along the line I drew up a mental eight by ten of a... Yeah, well, it doesn't matter. You just don't look the prototype. Perhaps that's because I'm only a junior partner in the firm, Mr. Marlowe. Yeah, maybe that's it. You know, it's an odd thing about prototypes, Mr. Marlowe. They'll trick you. Oh? For example, I've always had the idea that men in your... Well, I'll call it a profession. That's nice of you. That men in your profession always wore trench coats. Yeah, well, that's because Bogart looks so good in them. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Well, about our business together. I'll be here in Los Angeles a few days representing the firm in a number of ways, but while I'm here, I hope to locate a man by the name of Buff Ryan. Did you say that first name was Buff? Yes, odd name, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, But that's beside the point. This Buff Ryan, it seems, has inherited a small amount of money from a maiden aunt who passed away some time ago in Philadelphia. Oh. According to our information... My firm is executor of her estate. Uh, Mr. Ryan came west about a year ago. And until approximately six months ago, he could be reached at a Waring Street address in care of a C.A. Douglas. But our correspondence to him there has been returned, marked unknown at this address. That's the last record you have on him. Yes, that's the last. We've written to this uh, C.A. Douglas, but received no answer from him. I've called him since I arrived in town. 
There's been no answer. Well, maybe they've both left town, moved away. Well, that's possible, of course, but perhaps you'll find that out when you get to checking on Mr. Ryan. I see. Well, I'm to find him if I can and tell him about this inheritance, huh? By the way, how much is it? $5,000. Mm. Just about Miss Leader's entire estate. Miss Leader sounds like a comment. Her <laughs> full name, you may want that, was Julie Leader. Julie Leader. I'm sorry I can't show you a picture of Mr. Ryan. I'm expecting one to be sent out to me while I'm here. Expected it this morning, as a matter of fact. Yeah, well, maybe a description of him will do. Have you ever seen him? No, no. Uh, but we were able to find out that he's slightly less than six feet tall, light brown hair, straight. Uh, blue eyes, weighed about 180 pounds when he left Philadelphia a year ago. No distinguishing marks about him, according to our description. Oh, yes, and uh, he's about 35 years old. Well, that's pretty complete. Oh, uh, you better let me have the last address you have on Ryan, too. Oh, of course. Huh? Here. I've written it down for you with the phone number I've been calling. Mm -hmm. I'll be handling most of my business affairs right here at the hotel, Mr. Marlowe. I'll appreciate it if you'll check in occasionally. Let me know your progress. Oh, sure. I'd be glad to. Say around 3 o'clock this afternoon. Okay. Tell you everything I know, but then. <laughs> yeah, but then it might not be a thing. I know your reputation, Mr. Marlowe. You'll find him, I'm sure. Oh, don't get me wrong. If he's to be found, I'll probably find him. But I have missed, you know. Just why I should want to rock the confidence of a Philadelphia lawyer, I don't know. Maybe it was because Martin Allman, for all his conservative Brooks Brothers attire, looked too much or not enough like what he was supposed to be. Maybe it was because the East Los Angeles address he'd handed me for Buff Ryan was a cinch to be 30 degrees hotter. It was, too. Waring Street was lined with gray little houses surrounded by small gray lawns dotted with straggling gray trees. The color scheme was the direct result of long years of constant neglect. I knocked a long time on the door of the C.A. Douglas residence. The porch was littered with old papers and assortment of throwaways and leaves. The only response I got was from a scrawny cat, also gray, who leaped up on the porch rail to spit and yowl at me. <laughs> I yowled back and walked off the porch in the general direction of my car. That's when I noticed a smaller, grayer house behind this one, on the same lot. And I thought I saw a curtain at the front window move slightly. The cat dogged my steps back to see. Yeah? Oh, pardon me, but I'm trying to locate C.A. Douglas. Does he still live in the house in front of you? I don't know. I haven't seen Mr. Douglas in quite a while. Oh. You, uh, you think he moved away? Maybe. I don't know. How would I know? I don't know. Well, look, I'm, I'm in kind of a hurry. I'm getting dressed to go to work. How long have you lived here? What difference does it make? Did you ever know a guy named Buff Ryan? Of course not. Why, of course not. Why not just know? Listen, I don't know hardly anybody, and I don't know you. What? Um, now it's the phone. Go away, will you please, mister? No. No, I don't think Hello? I will, honey. She was tall, very blonde, very good to look at. A fresh blue housecoat wrapped around just the way it should. And even after I entered the spotless little living room, the faint aura of her cologne lingered on. I couldn't tell anything about the phone conversation she was having in the next room, but yeah, I could tell a lot about her by the several scantily clad pictures of her that greeted me from various points of the room. Yeah, I could tell a lot about her. Hey, what's the idea? You just can't walk in here. Do you want me to call the police? Not especially. I was just admiring your pictures. So? Yeah, you have exceptional handwriting. You're pretty nosy, aren't you? I particularly like this sample where it says... For Buff, darling, my love, Blossom. Listen, mister, I got things to do, so run along. How long have you known Buff, honey? You think I'm kidding about calling the cops? Well, I do it all right, only... Only what? Only I'm, I'm due downtown at work. I... Oh, honest, mister, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. You got no right to ask me questions about anything. And nothing says I got to answer. That's right, that's right, honey, you sure don't. Now, where's Buff? I don't know. I'll drive you downtown and you can tell me all about it, huh? You're driving me nowhere but out of my mind. Now, look, I got good news for your boy. He'd want to see me. Get out! Okay, Blossom, okay. 
What time's your first show? Two o'clock. How did you know? <laughs> yeah, I read the papers. And occasionally I've been known to contribute to the cultural progress of Los Angeles. You know, save the burlesque houses. The pictures she'd autographed to Buff had been propped up between my sugar bowl and the soul shaker the Sunday morning before in the theatrical section of the Sunday paper. Yeah, I didn't recognize her with a house coat on. And all the way back downtown, I reflected on the advantages of being well-read. Well, I parked in a lot on a side street to the north end of Skid Row and stopped for lunch at a newspaper man's hangout nearby. It was almost time for Blossom's first show when I felt fortified enough to walk along the street past the blank stairs of the winos and the dank air of the Muscatel missions. <laughs> Blossom's flag flew above the marquee. Blossom, the flower of burlesque. How many, please? One, huh? There you are, sir. Thanks. Say, so, do you think I can get in to see Blossom? I don't see how you can miss with buying the ticket and all. No, no, no. I mean, I'd like to see her personally in a dressing room. I'd oh. like to talk to her. Well, I'm sure you have my permission. Whether or not you'll get Blossom's is strictly between her and her moral fiber. You know something? You're not much help. You know something? I don't try to be. I'll miss you. <laughs> and here it is, your very last chance to go to Great Show. I'm about to pass among you with these boxes of delicious chocolate candy with the nuts inside. And don't forget with each and every break. I beg your pardon, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. With the purchase of every box of this delicious chocolate candy with the nuts inside. Our very special offer, a genuine gold one, for each and every person. He wasn't going to make a killing, exactly. There weren't more than six guys in the place. I wandered down the side aisle toward a door to one side of the stage and pushed through. I found myself in a dark, narrow catwalk of a hallway. Hey, the show's going to be out front, Mac. You guys can't come back here. Well, this guy did. Where can I find Blossom? Uh, out front. About ten minutes. I'll wait for her back here, thanks. Look, I can make myself clear if I had got I wish it. you would. Your lighting system's very bad back here. The light's out front where it counts, Mac. Come on, get Take out of here. Take it easy, fella. This is business. I don't like being pushed. Well, that can happen. You won't like it if you don't hey, get out of here. you two, you're causing too much commotion. Now get out front where you belong. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Now, look, I don't know who you are, Well, I can I... clear that up for you quick, friend. I'm the manager of this theater, and I'll run along like he did. Now, where can we talk? In your office? Why should I talk to you? Because I'm a booking agent. I want to talk to you about Blossom. She's booked. Okay, we'll talk about something else. Where's your office? Hey, now, look. The show's starting. We can't stay back here. Follow me. Hey, 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 hey Jerry. You sure have a bunch of art lovers in the audience. Sure, sure. It's a class show. Come on, through this door. All right. Now then, you're no booking agent, so what's on your mind? Blossom, and what's your name? Baloo, George Baloo. Why? Would it mean anything to you if I told you that Buff Ryan's Aunt Julie died in Philadelphia and left him 5,000 bucks? Wouldn't mean a thing. Wouldn't, huh? No. Mm -hmm. That's funny. Because you're the first one who'd fit the picture. What picture? Slightly under six feet tall, light brown hair, straight, blue eyes, about 35 years old, weigh about 180. And hey, what are you trying to prove, that you can see me? Maybe. So my Philadelphia message doesn't interest you, huh? Nothing about you interests me except how you got in here in the first place. Bought a ticket. Then go on out and see the show. I think I will. I also think I'll stick around and see Blossom after her uh, performance. I wouldn't do that. If I were you, I'd see the show and get out. I don't want any trouble around here. I don't either. And if you see Buff before the show's over, tell him I'm out front, will you? I said I don't want any trouble. You're in a rut. I walked down the aisle that led backstage the course I'd already charted. Blossom's costume was less demure than her blue house coat. <laughs> it was a school of thought surrounding me that this was more effective. Near the door, I stopped a moment and... Silent appreciation. Don't look at her like that. I, <laughs> I didn't know I was. You don't get any more ideas about going back to her dressing room. 
I ain't gonna like that. Now, look, look, go back to your seat. Live it up. Baloo said it was okay. He wouldn't say that. He knows better. All right, go tell him he knows better. Yeah, I will. You stay here. It was the same voice I met backstage the first time. The same pungent odor of muscatel. Before he'd lurched back up the aisle, I'd had a good look at a twisted face and a pair of watery blue eyes. Backstage, I waited for Blossom's act to conclude. It did. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, love that Monday through Friday night session of Smiles. Beulah is back with Hattie McDaniel again, starring as an overgenerous, overanxious to be wed, overweight damsel holding forth over CBS radio. Starting this Monday night, listen for Beulah and the Henderson family in a new season of delightful day to day doings. Beulah joins the fall parade of stars back to CBS radio on most of these stations beginning Monday night. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, Air for G-String. I couldn't have been out long. About eight bars of imagination unless I'd missed a full chorus. At some point, I was fuzzily aware of being carried sack style somewhere then being dropped not too gently onto a set of the noisiest springs I'd ever heard. This music lulled me for a while, and then I heard a door slam. And my head rolled off on the floor and broke. Come on, Marlowe, you're not dead. Is that official? How'd you get in here, anyway? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. I hardly believe it myself. You're not supposed to be yeah, back here. I know, here. I know, I know, I know. I've had that pointed out to me several times now. Yeah, and I didn't think I told you my name. Your wallet was on the floor. I can read. Oh, yeah. Well, good for you. Who hit me and with what size sandbag? I don't know. You never know anything, do you? Listen, Mr. Marlowe, you've been barging in all day where you're not wanted. Why didn't you tell me Buff was a wino? Oh! Hey, look, look. That's what's left of my head, huh? I hope it hurt. I hope it hurt awful. Well, you get your hope it did. Listen, you, I'm pretty fed up with you. No, just how you feel, Baloo. I told you before. I know what you told me. You don't want any trouble. Okay. (sighs) Okay, I'm going. Now, Blossom, what about Buff? I don't know. Oh, never mind. Now, don't tell me you want another ticket. Not me, kid. I've taken the cure. How is there moral fiber? Hmm? Like Gibraltar. <laughs> you know a guy named Buff Ryan? For free, I don't know my own mother. You don't, huh? Mm-mm. See your point. Here. Here's mine. Memory getting any better? Mm, it's um, clearing up a little. Thought it would. <laughs> well, uh, when he ain't here, which he ain't right now, He's um, usually at Mother Morris's. That's for one. Mother Morris's, huh? Mm Mm-hmm. Flop house, three doors down. Or for two, try Tilly's, four doors down. A saloon. Thank you. Mother Morris couldn't help me, lovable old lush that she was. And a penetrating search of the 25-cent bed she sold revealed a lot of things. But no Buff Ryan. Tilly's downstairs next door didn't look very promising at first, but that was before I saw the twisted face with the watery blue eyes at the far end of the bar. Beside him, the unofficial dean and philosopher of Skid Row, J. Fenton Prentice. I started toward them, but a cordon of winos surrounded me before I could reach him. That's him, Prentice. That's the one. Yeah, Prentice, I'm the one. Will you call the brothers here off, make them breathe in another direction, and let me talk to Buff? We're a close association here, Mr. Marlowe. Outsiders are not welcome. Oh, come on, Prentice, you know me well enough. Perhaps, Mr. Marlowe, but we know each other better, my associates and I. My young friend Buff here quite obviously does not wish to talk with you. We're merely respecting his wishes. In our own way. Oh, come on. Look, this is cockeyed. Maybe this isn't the place to say it, but you've inherited money, Buff. 
That's all I came to tell you. Anything? Yeah. Who died? Your Aunt Julie. Don't let him say any more, Prentice. Don't let him get to me. I gotta get out of here. If you gentlemen will restrain Mr. Marlowe. Go off, you crazy fool! Listen to me. There's a lawyer here from Philadelphia to see it. He's at the broad view, will you? For heaven's sake, get in touch with him. Listen to me. They will, son. They will. The lawyer's name is Martin Norman, you idiot. Go see him. Let go of me, you stupid dolts. Yeah. Thanks, Prentice. And nothing. Buff was nowhere to be seen when I hit the street. Didn't matter. It was three o'clock. I delivered my message from Martin Allman. Buff could take it from there. Now, I may be wrong, but most guys like to inherit dough. Still, you can never tell with a wino. And Buff was, as they say, bona fide. <laughs> Martin Allman was glad to see me. That was a nice change of pace. I told him all I knew. Didn't take long. I'm afraid you've had quite a bad experience, Mr. Marlowe. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, too. Oh, by the way, this picture arrived. Special delivery from Philadelphia about an hour ago. Oh? Is uh, this the reluctant chap you tracked down? Let me see that. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's Buff, before Muscatel. Well, you've done a fine job, Mr. Marlowe. I made your check out for you. Thanks. So you're going to try to get in touch with Buff yourself? Perhaps. Not personally, of course. You're certain that Waring Street address, the little house in back, should reach him? Yeah, yeah. Or I suppose you could get in touch with him through Blossom at the Burlesque Theater. Mm -hmm. Well, we've done all we can for now. Unfortunately, I've been called back to Philadelphia. I'm taking a plane out in an hour. Well, what about Buff and the inheritance? Well, now that I know he can be reached, we'll mail it to him. After all, we can't force it on him, now can we, Mr. Marlowe? No. Oh, doesn't look like we can. Yeah, well, he's all yours, Mr. Allman. Martin Allman seemed satisfied that we'd done our job. So I left wishing someone would come up to me and tell me Aunt What's Her Name had left me 5,000 clams. When I got back to my car, I had it all figured how I'd go home and forget what Martin had called quite a bad experience. One look inside my car told me it wasn't going to work out that way at all. You uh, weren't as long as I thought you'd be, Mr. Marlowe. How'd you get here from Skid Row, Prentice? Fly? I always taxi. How nice for you. After you left Tilly's, I fell to thinking, Mr. Marlowe. Quite a fall. It occurred to me that perhaps... You were telling Buff the truth all the time. I was. That's not important now, is it? Oh, yes. I should say it's quite important. Really? You mustn't be too hard on Buff, Mr. Marlowe. He's like most men on the row. He probably has his reasons for running. Running from life, perhaps. Running from himself. Or others... Are you trying to tell me something, Prentice? Now, that would be presumptuous of me, Mr. Marlowe. Temper justice with mercy. That much I say to you. I tell you, Buff Ryan is running. And with reason. If his reason interests you, then I suggest you set about finding out what it is. Well, is there any reason why I should? No. No, there isn't, but this much I do know. He has left the row, and he is running. I saved Jay Fenton Prentice's taxi fare back to what he affectionately referred to as the row. Yeah, he wouldn't have followed me if he hadn't wanted me to know something peculiar about Buff. And yet, his odd code kept him from telling me himself. I knew that code well enough to know that it had something to do with the police. Yeah, well, like I say, I'm a curious fella. Oh, well, now, Phil, uh, is this a big-time or small-time crook, this Ryan? He's pretty small, Sergeant Mooney, if he is one. Mm, aliases? No, not that I know of. Uh -huh. Well, we'll try Ryan just for size, huh? Mm. Buff's a crazy name. <laughs> He's a crazy guy. We'll have to look for it in the moniker file if we don't uh, have it here. Uh, uh, hold it here. Uh, this your guy? Where? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's it. Let's see that, will you? Take it out of there. Yeah. Let's see, not much of a reckon. Suspect, armed robbery, charges dropped. Suspect, extortion, charges dropped. I wonder why they bothered to take his picture. I don't know. Aliases, aliases. Buff Ragland, Bob Rutledge, C.A. Doug... C.A. Douglas. Hmm? Hello. 
What? It takes care of one question mark. Does it? Yeah, take my word for it, kid. It does. I see. Last question in connection with the slaying of Julie Leader, Philadelphia. Wait a minute. Aunt Julie, holy smoke. <laughs> I knew I didn't like this Martin Allman. I didn't bother to check his record. I got the picture. No wonder Buff ran from me like the plague. Martin had suckered me into setting Buff up for the kill. Marlowe, the finger man, that's great. Well, I got back to the theater and practically nothing flat. Yanked Blossom practically off stage, shoved her into my car and drove. Like mad to the little gray house behind the little gray house. Prentice said Buff had left Skid Row. If he wasn't on Waring Street, he might be anywhere, including dead. Martin was paying off a cab driver in front of the house. Blossom cued me to the alley entrance and back. Please, God. Please don't let anything happen to him. Don't crack now, honey. We'll make it in time. Just let us in. He's got to, Mr. Marlowe. He's my husband. Okay, okay. Take it easy, baby. Stand away from him, Blossom, or I'll kill you, too. No, Buff, no! Now, listen, Buff, Martin's coming in the front. You can't waste time with us. I don't believe you, Marlowe. You're part of the deal. Hey, what is this? You should have listened to me, Buff! I'm sorry, Blossom, I had to. He, he's he... all right, he's just out. Now listen, you've got to answer that front door. No! Answer it! I'll be right behind the door. He won't do anything to you, just let him come in. But, but I'm afraid... So am I, come on. Oh, how do you do? I was looking for a gentleman by the name of Buff Ryan. I'm an old friend of his. I understood he lived here. Yes. Yes, he does. Is he at home now? Yes. Won't you come in? Thank you. Marlowe, thank heaven. Thank me. I got his gun. Are you all right? Never felt better. Go throw some water on your boy and get him in here. Maybe he'll talk now. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I will. Now. Puff, darling, you're not hurt? Not anymore, honey. I don't figure you, I guess, Marlowe. I thought you were on Martin's team. I was at first, when I thought the business about you inheriting the 5,000 bucks was legitimate. What's he got against you? I saw too much once, about a year ago. I saw Martin kill Julie Leader. I was the only one who saw it. I knew he'd give me the same thing if he ever got the chance. He... he can't do that now, can he? Not if you'll talk, when we get the law here. Buff, why didn't you tell me? Silly question, honey. Sure, Marlo. Call the law. It'll be almost a pleasure to talk. So much for that. Buff and Blossom are doing fine. <laughs> Every once in a while, we sit in the third row and yell, down in front. Yeah, he's got a good job now. And soon they'll have enough for the traditional vine-covered respectability. Oh, by the way, <laughs> he's taken to wearing Brooks Brothers-type suits. You know what? He looks just like a Philadelphia lawyer. <laughs> How do you like that? The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, starring Gerald Moore, are produced and transcribed by Norman MacDonald, and written for radio by Kathleen Height. Featured in the cast were Jack Moyles as Buff Ryan, Michael Ann Barrett as Blossom, and John Stevenson as Martin Allman, with Sidney Miller as Mr. Ballou, Norman Field as J. Fenton Prentice, Grace Leonard as Gloria B., Sergeant Mooney is played by Jack Crucian. Gerald Moore may currently be seen in the Santana production, Sirocco. The special music for Philip Marlowe is composed by Pierre Garagank and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Be sure to listen next week at the same time when Philip Marlowe says, This time she was lovely and I was engaged. Engaged to help a beautiful shepherd who had a flock of trouble. We found a lost sheep and something else she didn't know she lost.
This coming Monday night, keep the evening free because the great fall parade of stars and shows back to CBS Radio will begin in earnest. Enjoy suspense moving into Monday evening, raising the curtain with William Holden in the leading role of a brand new spine tingler. Enjoy Lux Radio Theater's The Mudlark, starring Irene Dunn and Sir Cedric Hardwick. Enjoy the Bob Hawk Show, back in business with $3,000 to start the season's quiz bang fun. Yes, they're all coming back to CBS Radio this Monday night. Yours on most of these same CBS stations. Today, with the country rising to meet the challenge of aggression, the Red Cross has been asked by the government to undertake tremendous tasks. By giving generously to the Red Cross, you'll help mobilize for the defense of your families, your community, and the nation. Give as much as you can today. Clarence Cassell speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. Hi, this is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site. We stream live OTR Westerns 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, along with putting out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old-Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. I have to say that um, the whole Philadelphia lawyer set up screamed phony uh, from the start. And Marlo was kind of suspicious, but then uh, not about it. Because I think he's had similar things happen, and he should require more documentation than uh, just a say-so. But at any rate... Um, Oh, I will say that I also did like the philosopher of uh, Skid Row. Was well, a pretty interesting character. I wish they would had used more of them. All right, well, I should let you know that we are actually running out of Philip Marlowe. And then we'll have one more Philip Marlowe special before we uh, begin moving towards defense attorney. So a lot to look forward to in the weeks ahead. In the meantime, if you do have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook.